I have the pleasure today of introducing our co-chair of this entire series, Dr. Alexandra Chang, and she's going to chat with us about the future of lower back pain and where we go from, from here. But first, a little bit about Dr. Chang. Dr. Alexandra Chang completed her medical school education at the University of San Francisco. She then went on to complete a dual residency in internal medicine and anesthesiology at Loma Linda University Medical Center. She then returned back to UCSF for her fellowship in pain medicine, and we were really lucky to have her join the faculty and department at the uh, San Francisco Veterans Medical Center and part of the University of California, San Francisco. Currently, she divides her time between pain, ma pain management clinic and general anesthesiology. Outside of her clinical work, she focuses on teaching fellows, residents, and medical students. And she's also involved in process improvement projects, um, collaborating with the orthopedic surgery and the psychiatry departments. So I'm going to have her go ahead with her presentation. And after she's done, she's actually going to introduce our special speaker as well um, for this session. So today, I have the privilege to talk about the future of low back pain management. And I thought that we could talk about a particular treatment that we have previously mentioned in some of our lectures, which is neuromodulation. So today we will talk about what neuromodulation is, some examples of it for chronic low back pain, and then I'll turn it over to one of UCSF's researchers, Dr. Anastasia Keller, who will share the latest research on something called transcutaneous spinal cord stimulation for back pain. So what is neuromodulation? The International Neuromodulation Society defines it as the alteration of nerve activity through targeted delivery of a stimulus, which is something that could be an electrical stimulation or chemical agents that are delivered to specific neurological sites in the body. So just like how a pacemaker in the heart can deliver an electrical signal to fix or to override an abnormal heart rhythm, neuromodulation can deliver an electrical signal or it can deliver a medication to reduce pain signals or in a way to override or change the pain signals that reach the brain. There are different forms of neuromodulation. Um, this diagram includes some of the more common ones, including spinal cord stimulation, peripheral nerve stimulation, and also intrathecal drug delivery. And truthfully, each of these deserves their own lecture. But for today, we will focus just on spinal cord stimulation. So we'll talk a little bit about the history of spinal cord stimulation, how it works, who is it for, the procedure itself, and other important considerations that a patient should discuss with their physician. So in terms of the history, the use of electrical stimulation to treat pain is not new. Though Egyptians may have used this modality as far back as 2500 BC, the first written report came from the ancient Romans. In about 15 AD, a Roman physician found that electrical discharges from a torpedo fish could relieve gout pain. And then fast forward to many centuries later in the 1700s, when it was discovered that electrical shocks could cause muscle contractions or in the 1800s, when it was discovered that electrical shocks directly on the brain's motor cortex could cause muscle contractions. In 1965, Melzack and Wall proposed the gait control theory of pain, a concept which became very important for introducing neuromodulation to treat pain. So the gait theory says that the perception of pain depends on whether the gate is open or closed to these pain signals that travel to the brain. And this depends on the balance of the firing of small and large nerve fibers. So small nerve fibers send signals to the brain about pain. 
while larger nerve fibers send signals to the brain about touch or vibration, which are not generally painful. For example, if you were to stub your toe and then start rubbing the skin, you would be stimulating the large nerve fibers that send signals to the brain about touch. So the gate is effectively closed off to the pain signals and you perceive less pain. Um, and this similarly works with things like the TENS unit, which some of you may already be using. Um, in 1968, the um, spinal cord stimulator first became commercially available. And this early spinal cord stimulator had two parts, an implantable electrode and an external power supply. And then by the 1980s, we had the first fully implantable spinal cord stimulator. So how do spinal cord stimulators work for pain? In general, they work by sending electrical signals or impulses to the spinal cord, which interrupt or change the pain signals before they reach the brain. To take a little bit more of a closer look at it, there are different ways that one can stimulate the spinal cord. One way is called tonic stimulation. And this one is probably most closely based on that gait control theory of pain that we just talked about. So what happens is that electrical signals activate the larger nerve fibers in the spinal cord. And this ultimately closes the gait to not allow the pain signals from the smaller fibers to reach the brain. Because these larger nerve fibers are being activated though, patients can sometimes feel tingling sensations, or another word for that is a paresthesia, and it tends to overlie the area of their pain. For some patients, these paresthesias can be uncomfortable. Another type of spinal cord stimulation called high frequency stimulation delivers, like its name implies, more charge per second to the spinal cord. It probably does not activate the large nerve fibers since no paresthesias are felt. There are several hypotheses about how this type of stimulation works for pain control, including that it might be blocking nerve fibers from sending signals. Another type of spinal cord stimulation is called burst stimulation where there is a burst or cluster of electrical impulses that gets sent to the spinal cord, followed by a longer time interval without the stimulation. It might work similarly to tonic stimulation, but it also activates part of the brain that's involved in the emotional aspect of pain. So who is spinal cord stimulation for? While you might see that spinal cord stimulation is used to treat many pain conditions, there are certain ones where spinal cord stimulation may be more strongly recommended based on the level of evidence and the data that we have with well-designed studies. So these particular conditions that we have better data for include failed back surgery syndrome and complex regional pain syndrome. But the most common reason for using spinal cord stimulation and the most relevant to our lecture is for failed back surgery syndrome. And there are many other conditions that spinal cord stimulation is recommended for that I didn't list here, but most of those conditions have to do with pain of other areas of the body, not the back. Um, we could truthfully spend an entire lecture talking just about failed back surgery syndrome. Uh, but in brief, it is chronic pain that can either be back and or leg pain that either persists despite back surgery or it's new pain that starts after surgery. And from a physiological standpoint, there are many possible things that can cause that kind of pain. Um, including scar tissue that might form around nerve roots or having painful hardware or having spinal degeneration above or below the level of surgery or perhaps even increased spinal instability or redistribution of weight or load uh, to an adjacent disc. 
So how is spinal cord stimulation actually performed? Generally, patients may first have tried other types of therapies for their back pain, such as medications, physical therapy, injections, among other things. However, for patients who are determined to be a good candidate for spinal cord stimulation, the process often starts with an in-depth discussion about this therapy, as well as an evaluation by a pain psychologist in order to ensure the best possible outcomes from the spinal cord stimulation. When it's time for the actual procedure itself, we start with a trial. So during the trial, leads, which look like strings, are placed in an epidural space. The first picture here shows a cross-sectional view of the spine if you were to imagine the patient lying on his or her abdomen with a needle going through the patient's back to access the epidural space. And remember that the epidural space is outside of the spinal cord, but it does contain the nerve roots. In the second picture in the middle, you'll see an x-ray picture, and it shows two leads which look like strings, and each of those leads contains multiple electrodes, which kind of look like pearls or ants on a string. These epidural leads then get connected to an external battery pack. And this third picture shows what everything looks like from the outside once it's all secured with bandages. Patients are then encouraged to do their usual daily activities and they're instructed to keep track of their pain level, their physical function, like how long they can tolerate standing, sitting, walking, and how much pain medications they take. These trials generally last for multiple days, oftentimes up to a week. At the end of that period, the epidural leads are removed and then patients will discuss the next steps with their physicians. So what happens after the trial? If the trial was determined to be successful, then the patient may proceed with a spinal cord stimulator implant. The epidural leads may be placed in a similar way as during the trial, but one major difference is that the battery pack will be implanted inside of the patient. So um, in these pictures, you can see a, a little battery pack that looks like a square, um, just kind of off on the left side of the patient's back. So most spinal cord stimulators have four parts. They generally consist of an impulse generator, which contains a battery and sends electrical signals to the epidural leads. They also consist of the epidural leads themselves, which have electrodes, which deliver the currents to the spinal cord. And then there's a handheld controller, which the patient can use to adjust the stimulation or even to turn their system on or off. And then there's a handheld charger to recharge the battery pack. There are many different device companies that make spinal cord stimulators, and some makes and models may not actually require charging or recharging. It's also important to consider some of the potential complications and risks, which include infections, pain around the implant site, migration or movement of the epidural leads, and very rarely spinal cord injury. Another consideration is that we don't have long-term data that goes out 20 or 30 years. For example, it's hard for us to predict what would happen with the patient's pain symptoms or functional status 20 or 30 years after having the spinal cord stimulator implanted. And finally, it's important to think about some of the differences among the spinal cord stimulator systems. There are many companies that make these systems. And um, as an example, some devices might limit the kinds of MRI scans you can get on your body. 
Some devices might require daily recharging and some devices might cause you to feel the paresthesias or tingling that we talked about and some may not. So in summary, that was a brief introduction, a very brief introduction about what spinal cord stimulation is and how it can be used in the management um, of back pain. So our next speaker, Dr. Anastasia Keller, will share the latest research about a unique therapy that is currently being studied at UCSF. Um, Dr. Keller is an assistant professional researcher in the Department of Neurological Surgery at UCSF. Uh, she is a member of UCSF's Brain and Spinal Injury Center, as well as the core center for patient-centric mechanistic phenotyping in chronic low back pain. Dr. Keller is conducting clinical and analytical research with a primary focus in pain neurobiology, maladaptive plasticity, and neuromodulation, including spinal cord stimulation as a form of rehab, rehabilitation after spinal cord injury, as well as in chronic low back pain. And Dr. Keller is currently running a clinical trial testing the non-invasive spinal cord stimulation for treatment of chronic low back pain at UCSF, uh, which I'm very excited to hear more about. So please welcome Dr. Keller. Thank you so much, Dr. Cheng, for the introduction. Um, Yes, indeed, uh, we have some uh, interesting, exciting um, movement in front on um, innovation in uh, spinal cord stimulation field. Um, but first, I would like to um, go over some basics of pain neurobiology, and here I will list the objectives of um, the rest of the uh, time um, here today. So I just want us to all get on the same page about the definitions. And we have, a, I'm sure, a variety of um, backgrounds here in the audience. So I would like to just um, explain some very basic things about the acute and chronic pain mechanisms, because I also think it's really interesting and fascinating. I think up to this point, um, we ha we've had some speakers who really went into depth about the spine structures that are what we would consider consider orthopedic uh, generators of pain, but ultimately pain is processed in the central nervous system. And that's what I want to kind of bring um, some of the really basic anatomy here and to um, talk about that. And also mention some internal pain modulation mechanisms that we have inside our body. And then I will go into the um, introduction of our um, ongoing clinical trial on transcutaneous spinal cord stimulation and um, kind of uh, how we got here, right? The rationale and the study design. We have some pre preliminary results that I'm excited to share and we'll wrap up with summary and conclusions. So um, the basics of neuro pain neurobiology. So we'll just start with the what what system are we talking about and um the there is central and peripheral nervous system so the central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system consists of the somatic nervous system so your spinal nerves are belonging to the somatic nervous system and then there's autonomic nervous system which is the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system these these function to control involuntary uh, and regulate involuntary um, actions that are kind of always running in the background, like our heart rate or digestive system. So, but I must say that pain experience involves all parts of the nervous system to some extent, especially severe pain will engage the sympathetic uh, nervous system. If you stub your toe really hard, you may have increased breathing and you will notice that. So some of it is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So some other definitions that, you know, we as scientists, um, we parse out pain and nociception. So nociception refers to the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system processing of the noxious stimuli. Um, that is uh, noxious is the tissue injury or uh, potentially damaging um, stimuli. So it could also be like a temperature extremes. And the nociceptors um, are these small fibers that Dr. Chang already mentioned. So these are uh, receptors for noxious stimulus, right? So um, 
nociception refers to just the activate uh, uh, biological activation of that system. And the pain is the subjective experience one feels as a result of activation of these pathways. So we like to differentiate that because there's a lot goes on between nociception and pain. You can have nociception without perception um, of pain as well. And pain, it really constitutes a, a wide range of unpleasant sensory and emotional experiences. Another thing you may hear me say through this talk is synapse or synaptic connection. And those are the junctions between two nerve cells. And that's how our uh, nervous system is connected. So each neuron is connected to another neuron through these synapses. And there is a little gap between each synapse and the neurons communicate between each other via release of neurotransmitters or these little uh, molecules that are chemicals. And then the the other term is um, I would like you to be familiar with is central sensitization. Um, that is a process that takes place um, in the nervous system in chronic stages of pain. And it's, it's an increased responsiveness of the nociceptors in the central nervous system to either normal or subthreshold sense, sensory um, input resulting in hypersensitivity to stimuli. So if you, would, you may have central sensitization if all of a sudden a brush or a touch to a skin now feels like pain. So there is an example of central sensitization. And then the maladaptive plasticity is actually a process that central sensitization is part of. And so that's the changes that in the nervous system will lead to the disruption of the function and could eventually, if it's prolonged or, or unresolved or needs treatment, it's considered a disease state. So if we look at pain processing, what actually takes place. This is a little animation. Um, probably some of us have been, have hammered our finger once or twice in the process of building something. So what happens is actually a cascade of events. For you to feel pain, first things that happen is the this labeled as A delta and C fiber. Those are these small offerings, so small sensory uh, nervous tissue that gets activated um, when we hammer our finger. And then uh, these signals go through our nerves all the way to the spinal cord where the, the first connections are made. So a lot of the connections and um, processing of this first input happens at the spinal cord level. It's our center for integration of sensory and motor information. So a good example is touching a really hot stove. You will pull away your hand before you even feel that this is painful. And that's a, a very classic example of a reflex arc um, that is programmed in the spinal cord. So a lot of decision-making, quote unquote, it happens at the spinal cord level um, and we remove our, pain, our hand from a harmful stimuli before we even process that this was a painful stimulus. That is because there's a lot of processing that takes place at the spinal cord level. Now, ultimately those signals are gonna be propagated through the central nervous system. So what you see here are basically kind of like the cross-sectional slices through the uh, central nervous system. So these, this butterfly sort of shape is your gray matter of the spinal cord. And then there's Y matter tracks that are running all the way to, through the brainstem regions to your to your brain area. And there, there's even more projections and even more connections that um, are made. And ultimately this very top synapse right here, this is your cortex. And this is where you, when you become aware that something painful has happened, this is when in, this, in the brain area, this, this is where nociception. So up to this point, up to the brain area, all of this is a nociception. And at the brain level is where we become aware of pain and we have an emotional response to it. So we have an aversion and, and are <laughs> upset likely that we have unfortunately hammered our hand. So the gate control theory onto pain modulation um, and how we have some mechanisms for how we can self-soothe or also these interesting mechanisms of, of, um, of internal regulation of pain. So Dr. Cheng already mentioned the gate theory, and this is just an illustration of that principle. So the nociceptor fibers, again, those are the ones that have abundant projections um, or innervation in our skin and a bone, muscle everywhere. And they, they respond to harmful stimuli. That's when they become activated. 
The mechanoreceptors are the other types of nervous uh, sensory fibers that are responding to touch or the um, any sort of pressure. So when we hammer our finger, we have these pain signals that are being sent in through the spinal cord to the thalamus where it's first processed in the brain. And rubbing your hand at the same place where you have hurt yourself or pain, you know, in, non, in a non-painful manner, it will activate these other sensory fibers. There are mechanoreceptors and they also have connections at the spinal cord level. And that's where this gate um, the, the term of this theory gate comes in because it closes the gate for this nociceptive information to be sent up to the brain. And instead, uh, um, what you see, uh, sense is more of uh, a touch. And so that has to do with the different difference in diameter of the um, mechanoreceptors and nociceptor fibers. Now, the other thing that is really, I think, fascinating and uh, what changes with chronic pain in chronic pain states is this internal pain control system. So again, when you have a painful stimulus acutely, what happens is that you have all the signaling goes to your brain, you perceive pain through different experimental models. Um, they have found this very particular area that's called, called periaqueductal gray and raphae nucleus that are located in your brainstem regions in the cervical spine, spinal cord or above a cervical spinal cord. That's where your brainstem is connecting kind of the brain and, and the spinal cord. So there is these um, um, nuclei in, in the brainstem region that are bunches of neurons that get activated by this incoming nociceptive signal, because this nociceptive offerings and in, in these other proprio-spinal networks that process this information at the spinal cord level, they make these connections or those synapses that I was talking about. And these, um, these synapses are then activating these neurons that have these, what we call descending projections or projections that go back down to the spinal cord level where the input, the nociceptive input is first coming in. And these descending neurons are now releasing other types of neurotransmitters that inhibit pain at the spinal cord level. So we have this, and which is why in acute pain, we don't go on hurting forever once we stab our toe or when we hit our finger with a, with a uh, hammer. It's because of these internal pain controlling mechanisms. We have a way to shut down pain. And one of the changes in chronic pain is that this system has been shown in different studies that this system changes um, in, in how it regulates the incoming pain information. What I've talked about so far is more of an acute pain experience, um, but what about chronic pain? Now, we really have been appreciating a lot that uh, the biological factors and psychological factors and social factors all play a huge role in pain experience. You can't really dissect out too much as to what contributes to what, although that's one of the goals here at UCSF Reach Center that I'm a part of. We're trying to really collect as much data as possible from all kinds of backgrounds of patients who um, have uh, chronic low back pain, and we're trying to understand or phenotype uh, pain and um, different ways that biological versus psychological versus social factors all contribute to this really complicated chronic pain experience. But if we really zoom back into the neurochemistry, right, and the central nervous system changes or peripheral nervous system changes, um, it's really in and of itself a quite a uh, challenging puzzle that there are a lot of scientists who really devote their whole lives to understand just one cell type, right, just the neurons themselves. How do they change with pain, right? So that's why we have these elaborate um, studies to try to understand the neurobiology of pain. And at, very, at every level of the nervous system, there's been recognized changes in peripheral fibers, right? The, how this, the nociceptors react to pain, they become hyperactive. Um, their cell bodies change, um, they're, they sprout. Or, so basically, if you think of the neurons as uh, uh, um, they're able to grow, uh, and nociceptors are actually notorious for sprouting. So they make even more connection in the spinal cord. And they start projecting to the neurons that they normally have not had connections with before. 
And then the brain also reorganizes in chronic pain. So your brain looks different when you've had acute pain versus chronic pain that has been well documented. So your resting state activity in pain is very different than that of when you do not have pain. And so in general, it could be summarized that we become really hypersensitive, our nervous system becomes sensitized, and also we become hypervigilant, right? So now um, this pain experience is really becoming a, an alarm um, all the time. And we change the way we move, we change uh, the uh, amount of movement we do on daily basis, and, and all of that is um, considered to be somewhat maladaptive in chronic stages. So with that, I will wrap up and we'll move on to the um, UCSF clinical trial that we are running and the rationale for it. So this is something that um, Dr. Cheng already explained, so we'll kind of um, breathe over this. But uh, epidural spinal cord stimulation is one of the more effective tre treatments for chronic low back pain. Um, and yes, it is indicated right now for individuals who have failed multiple back surgery, meaning that you've already fixed any, anything that has been potentially identified as wrong with your spine. So you fixed your facet joints, you fixed your vertebral uh, misalignment, or you um, have re resected your uh, disc that has been um, uh, deformed, but you are still, your pain persists, right? And the doctors are now considering that the source of your pain is more has neurological components. So um, epidural spinal cord stimulation is really individuals with neuro, neuro, neuropathic or more neurological source of pain really respond quite well to uh, spinal cord stimulation. But because it is invasive, right, it requires an invasive procedure, you have to have electrodes implanted over your spine, and you have the battery pack that has to be placed um, so it, 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 into the abdomen, and so that you have now a device inside your body. Because of the invasive nature of this procedure, uh, the promise, uh, this promising treatment is last resort because for obvious reason. So um, my background is actually in doing spinal cord injury research. Um, in I uh, for my PhD and my first postdoctoral training, I was doing clinical research, and this is where I was first introduced to uh, epidural spinal cord stimulation. And um, in spinal cord injury field, it's been discovered that individuals who has uh, spinal cord stimulation stimulators placed below the level of injury are all of a sudden able to move and even regain walking after a certain amount of training. So it has been really groundbreaking. And these two publications that I've screenshotted have really been um, a, a big breakthrough in that field. Um, and in that field, the spinal cord injury researchers designed a non-invasive spinal cord stimulator. And it's very similar in a sense to TENS units that perhaps some of you are familiar with in that you do place the electrodes on the skin, but the electrodes go, they're smaller in size and the electrodes go directly between the two vertebral segment that researchers palpate and um, we place the electrode in, in the space where there is the biggest gap between your two vertebral segments. And the another really different or, or say what, what sets this particular device apart from other available TENS units, and um, I wouldn't suggest slapping a, a TENS unit onto your spine after this lecture, is that this, this um, in order for us to get to the spinal cord, because remember with epidural spinal cord stimulation, you're placing electrodes directly onto the spinal cord. That's why you are implanting them, right? You're going through the multiple layers the skin, the fat, the muscle, the bone. And now we have to reach the spinal cord that is safely encaps encapsulated into a vertebral column. We have to now reach that from the skin level. And by have to, I really think that it's exciting that we're able to do it. And for, for us to do that, the same nociceptors that we talked about before, they will resp respond to the electrical current as well, right? So for us to not activate your nociceptors and for us to not make this a painful procedure at the skin level with intense current that is required for us to get to the spinal cord, there is this particular frequency and particular stimulation parameter that is proprietary to this device. Um, and it's called modulated, really high frequency kilo, kilohertz, 10 kilohertz um, current that is sufficient to break up the pulse width which is one of the important features of the current or just how physics works of electrical current passing to the, to the tissues. And 
this device has this specific parameters that um, let us what I like to just kind of refer to bypass the activation of nociceptors at the skin level. So when I came to UCSF, um, well, actually, let's back up. When Before I came to UCSF, I um, used this specific device to demonstrate its efficacy and safety uh, to um, improve upright sitting posture in children with spinal cord injury. So my first experience, I was treating uh, children with spinal cord injury using this particular de device. And um, these children are par paralyzed. They do not have trunk control, so they are not able to sit upright normally. And so what we were testing and published now this work that using this device was safe, meaning there was no adverse uh, effects. Children responded well to stimulation. And more than that, we were able to potentiate their upright sitting posture. So th these results are published in there. Actually, you are, um, if you screenshot this or you are able to look up this article and read it for free. So the uh, because there has been also um, a large number of studies now in the spinal cord injury field that has demonstrated that both epidural and transcutaneous spinal cord stimulation are able to activate same structures in the spinal cord. Um, when I came here and started collaborating and started doing my um, work at the UCSF Chronic Low Back Pain Center, I um, quickly came to realize that this would be a really a natural transition for us to assess and test whether we now can also use transcutaneous spinal cord stimulation to not only treat severe paralysis after spinal cord injury, but also see if we can treat pain, because we know that epidural spinal cord stimulation is pretty efficacious for that. So I will show you this video as more like a print proof of concept um, that we are able to reach spinal cord uh, non-invasively. And this particular individual has a spinal cord injury at thoracic level nine. So are they're paralyzed uh, below the waist level and they're not able to stand. They're dependent on a wheelchair for mobility. And uh, in this video, they uh, the researchers here are testing their ability to stand up um, with the spinal cord stimulation that this same device that we have now here in testing for chronic low back pain in they're asking this participant to stand up with the assistance um, on a walker. And again, this individual is what we would consider completely and fully dependent on a wheelchair for their mobility. They're not able to stand, but in the presence of spinal cord stimulation, what you see here, this is their muscle activity. So, and the muscle activity is in the legs, right? So that means that with this stimulation, we're activating the motor neurons of the leg muscles that are located at the spinal cord level where the stimulation is delivered. So this is just a proof concept that this paralyzed individual is now able to stand in a process of stimulation, meaning that we are able to reach spinal cord networks um, through the skin now. So onto the study design and what we're doing here specifically for chronic low back pain patients. So uh, we are recruiting patients as of right now, actually. Um, we have a registration posted on clinicaltrials.gov, and um, I am happy to share links and um, survey links to the registration and the Qualtrics survey where we're screening patients. So um, upon we recruit patients, we uh, the patients undergo battery of assessment because as we've been as we've been talking about this whole in this whole lecture series, pain is really complicated. So we are trying to understand it from any angles that is available to us. We're trying to understand it as patient reported outcomes. So we would ask you a number of different questions that, you know, obviously pain intensity, but also how does it affect your quality of life, your psychological well-being? Um, so that's what we refer to patient reported outcomes. Now we have a number of other outcomes that we are collecting to understand how you move. So the biomechanics of full 3, 3D body biomechanics um, or during sit to stand movement. Um, and we collect muscle EMG activity at this time. We also have um, our patients go through brain scans to look at their brain activity, because as I mentioned, in chronic pain, there are significant changes. So we're trying to assess what is your baseline status in terms of your MRI, your uh, functional connectivity in the brain. We assess that uh, with the fMRI and also the electroencephalography. Both of these are non-invasive ways for us to look inside the brain. Um, 
And then we administer uh, spinal cord stimulation. And so right now we are doing it on site. So patients report to the laboratory for, for uh, therapy uh, sessions. And I actually had one um, who had, is administering, so I would be treating um, the participant in the study. And uh, I really wor work with patient schedule, but I, uh, usually we go at three times a week pace for four to seven weeks. And um, there's a, a process in which I establish different thresholds level that are um, skin sensation versus uh, maximum tolerable level of stimulation to um, and those are the sort of things that 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 are happening in the first couple of sessions. And then you receive continuous stimulation for about 30 minutes at each session. And then we're tracking your pain scores throughout the, the study. And then we take these same assessments after that. So you would go through biomechanics and the EMG and the brain and the e electroencephalography assessments after therapy as well, because now we're trying to understand is there a change in your pain scores? And also how does it relate to any other sort of functional outcomes? So as with any clinical trial, there is inclusion and exclusion criteria that we have to define the population in which we are studying, but I would say it's pretty broad. Um, the major things that we are looking at is that you are not severely depressed, that your BMI is um, below 28. And you know you have to be an adult, obviously, and your pain intensity has to be a certain level in order for us to be able to see whether there is an effect or not. So as I mentioned, this is just a screenshot of the, uh, you can look it up um, and just Googling transcutaneous spinal cord stimulation for chronic low back pain, the UCSF, this registry should pop up. And actually it's been our main recruitment site so far. Um, and we have screened 33 patients. The four patients that I would like to share the results of today have completed the study already. And um, these individuals have, um, are, um, as you see here, has, have a little bit of spread in terms of age. The youngest is a 42-year-old fem female, and then um, the old oldest was a 72-year-old male with different diagnoses. Um, none of these patients had back surgery before. So one of the things I didn't mention, but the advantage of the non-invasive nature is that now we don't have to have individuals go through multiple surgeries, fail them, and only then have access to electrical spinal cord stimulation as a potential therapy. Now, that also may mean that if you truly have an orthopedic issue that needs to be fixed, our therapy may not help you that much because orthopedic and neurological uh, issues both contribute to the pain experience. But nevertheless, trying something non-invasive before you go on to proceed to surgery is also another way for us to screen um, whether you would be a good candidate and uh, um, your pain genesis is more of neurological origin rather than orthopedic. So then you don't have to fail surgeries um, at first, right? So that kind of redefines our model of how we are screening for low back pain neuromodulation as a therapy. So I'll show you these graphs of these patients and their pain scores that as we, uh, we've been tracking them over a month. So the therapy is administered. So each of these participants, they've gone through 12 sessions of stimulation, right? So, but I track pain every single day. So it's one of the things if you sign up for a study and you participate, we ask you to, we vigorously and uh, um, always tracking and want to know how you, how you feel in your pain. So we have these um, surveys that get sent out to you every day and you report your pain in the evening, usually throughout the day, whether it's a stimulation day when you receive the therapy or on non-stimulation days. So um, just to orient you, the, there's, um, the scores are reported as these dots, right? Every single day. And this person, um, 70 year old uh, male had pain starting at about 80 on, on the intensity scale. So he was reporting pretty intense pain. 100 is maximum pain, zero is no pain. Um, and now this line here is just a projection. So this person has found us because they've already tried other treatments. It hasn't been working. They were doing research online, popped up on the clinical trial at UCSF because that's where they are located. And so they contacted us, enrolled. And so, but I presume that this would be their trajectory, right? Hypothetical trajectory of this person who has been already in pain for this long. Now we start therapy 
And the pain scores for this participant diminished significantly immediately, right? And they stayed low throughout the study. And what I'm showing is the back, right leg, and left leg pain. So this participant had um, high back and right leg pain, and both responded really well to uh, stimulation in this case. The next patient, uh, same thing in terms of the um, projections or how the graph is oriented. Now, this participant had back pain, but the response was not as robust as you can see here. There was decrease in pain, but it wasn't as meaning, well, I wouldn't say meaningful because there was still report, like as far as quality of life, there's still re reported um, changes, uh, but it's just not as robust. This participant um, had a really good response in their legs. And so spinal cord stimulation is one of the treatments that is also um, been uh, used to in, in, in traditional epidural spinal cord stimulation has been used to treat leg pain as well. So um, the back pain responded, right? So there is some decrease. Um, we, we kind of halved the pain for back, but we really flattened out the uh, leg pain. So by the end of tr therapy treatment, there is virtually no leg pain. And that really contributed to significant improvement in how the participant was just feeling about their life. And there is another participant that's, uh, and also um, changes, but this participant had very different uh, responses on non-stimulation day versus stimulation day. So there is usually a greater decrease in pain on stimulation day versus non-stimulation day. So as you can see here, and this is so typical of pain and what we see in patients, and that's why it's been so hard for us to really find an answer is that each individual is so different and the response to treatment is so different. That is why there's not really a magical pill or a cookie, cookie cutter answer for any of this. And so that's why we're trying to phenotype patients and understand what groups and subgroups of patients within this really broad chronic low back pain, really a disease that is really affecting the whole world, right? The Americans are not alone. It's a number one cause of disability worldwide, right? And so when we have all these different backgrounds, all different uh, kinds of issues that could be within the biological systems or socioeconomic systems, and we have to understand the subgroups that will respond really well to this therapy, and these other subgroups will respond really well to this other therapy. And so it really takes a long time for us to really, and, and a long time and a lot of data for us to really start parsing out. Um, so your participation as individual with chronic low back pain in clinical trials, not just this one, but any sort of clinical trial in that helps us understand this condition and contrib contributing your uh, knowledge of your experience, right? To, to, and as data to us so that we can make sense of it is really important um, for us to make progress. So now I showed you the four graphs, right? Individual scores, but eventually what we do as researchers, we kind of group things, right? So we, I took an average of all those scores at baseline versus what was it like over a month of treatment for these four patients on average and what was the final score um, that the patients reported. And as you can see here, what these asterisks is what we use in all of our papers is the statistics, right? We run, run certain statistical tests. There's mathematical in nature that we try to understand. Is there a significant difference? Um, now, a significant difference in math doesn't always mean a significant difference clinically, right? Also very important distinctions because sometimes results are not significantly different, but patients would say, this significantly improved my life. So there's a, uh, there's a, a difference in those two different definitions as well. So I would say this is a significant difference mathematically, but also we have a pain. We have the, the pain that participants have experienced. So if I was in pain of 80 and I went down to 40, I would I think I would be pretty happy with that. So another thing to mention, right, this is a, a clinical trial, meaning that we are just in the beginning scratching the surface stages, right? We're just trying to understand, collect the data, on types of patients who this may be a good treatment for versus those who may not respond, right? So we always consider that this is responder versus non-responder issue. And what we also understand is that this is very low dose at this stage, right? This device that I am using right now, it's, it's one 
it's the only one that I have. And uh, because it's an experimental device, I'm not able to give it out and send it out for a person to test in real world, meaning when every day you get up, you use it whenever you want to, right? So, but eventually that's our goal, right? So we are now first trying to establish the efficacy of this. If it passes this first test, then we can go to the FDA, we can go to um, the uh, National Institute of Health, NIH for more funding and say, we're showing preliminary efficacy and actually we are doing that. That's my next stage is to write, write this other grant for us to get a phase two trial going here official at UCSF because this is more of a pilot study. And then we are going to be once we really demonstrate so it's always resource for always comes in steps right once we are able to demonstrate that this is a go. This is really promising for these types of patients. We're then going to be able to manufacture it so that you have access to it at home, right? So that's the eventual goal. Epidural spinal cord stimulation, that what our treatment right now we're proposing as an alternative, non-invasive alternative to it. That treatment is with you at home always, right? You have it constantly on to bring about 50, 80% relief. That is what's been documented in the studies. So our study is really low dose. It's very experimental, um, but that is uh, kind of where we're going with that in the future. So the conclusion so far, not a cure, did not expect it to be a cure, but it is a therapeutic and an investigational tool that we're using right now. Pain is really complicated, right? Um, and just, I have this here because it's, you know, the biological, psychological, social factors, the biopsychosocial model of low back pain. And there's, if we, you know, simplify this again, there's orthopedic issues that may have going on and you have neuro issues that are going on with prolonged pain, your nervous system changes. We know that for the fact we've studied this for many, many years. So the combination of these factors will result to your pain experience just from the biological standpoint, right? Not ignoring all other factors. And what we can do with this experimental treatment and when we are testing neuromodulation, we're affecting where this side primarily, right? There's other mechanisms that it, I don't really have time to go into, but there's other mechanisms where we know that with prolonged stimulation, you increase blood flow to peripheral tissues. So there is over time could be some changes in the ortho side as well with neuromodulation or specifically spinal cord stimulation, because we are affecting the outflow of other nerve types, not just the sensory. We're not just changing the sensory um, projections, right, to the brain, although that's the primary mechanism of pain relief, but there's also other uh, structures in the central nervous system that are affected by spinal cord stimulation that we're hoping to uh, change here. So we can use this as a, a way to basically understand in each individual person is how much of pain relief can be um, achieved by neuromodulation, right? Is this going to be now manageable per, for a person so they no longer have to rely on their NSAIDs that are, we know long-term are not good um, for you, you know, for your stomach, for your kidneys? Uh, and also, you know, opioids, not even mention that, right? So spinal cord stimulation has been shown to be opioids bearing um, method for treatment of pain. So really important implications of that. So um, what I showed you today, apart from a little really brief medical school type of lecture on pain neurobiology, you know, we are testing the first ever application of transcutaneous spinal cord stimulation for treatment of pain here. And we're showing that it probably has a promising avenue and promising avenue ahead of us. Um, the goal of all this comprehensive sensory motor patient profiling, so all these different outcome measures we're collecting, not just the pain scores, although that it is our primary outcome measure, because the most important thing, does it help you, right? So we are tracking that, but also are, these, are there things that we collect are really important for us to understand the mechanisms of pain, because the better we understand what is going on with your motor system, with your brain, the better we are able to predict the responses, right? And, and differentiate patients who are gonna be responders and non-responders. And eventually what our hope is that we will use the results that are generated in this preliminary study, right? We call it preliminary, but really is a full on clinical trial. And, you know, we hope to then be able to apply for larger grants to really establish the efficacy to just basically, you know, as 
as it is with any sort of therapeutic, we have to check all these boxes for that to advance and become a mainstream available um, indication for patients um, anywhere, right? So you could eventually at some point order this on Amazon, although I, I don't foresee it quite have that future because it, you know, placement over the spinal cord is quite, um, you know, quite specific. And, but with proper training, I think it is possible to, um, to gear um, this sort of device in the future towards home use. So just like to acknowledge the fact that I have a really big team and just uh, bring up all these beautiful faces that are my collaborators and individuals who are working, I'm working with on uh, carrying out this investigation. So, and with that, I think we are ready for any sort of questions that I might have come up and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Drs. Keller and Dr. Chang. Um, that was that was fantastic, and I think for the audience, um, this is just a really small sample of all the active um, research and work that's being put in to kind of um, help advance um, the treatment of chronic lower back pain from where it is today. So, some really good, exciting stuff um, happening here at, at UCSF, especially. Um, so with that being said, I think uh, we have some questions that are in the Q&A that we'll start to go through. Um, the first question is, what is the current understanding about the role of hormones in chronic or recurrent acute lower back pain? Um, I know we've kind of touched upon this previously, but I think Dr. Keller said that she um, wanted to make a comment about that. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, um, it's a really good question. And in fact, there is a lot of literature. Rec well, recently, not so recently, the article that I was recently reading on that is from 2007. And there is actually biological reasons that are linked to sex hormones. And I'm not sure if um, Cynthia was asking about sex hormones or any sort of hormones, but the ones that I'm most familiar with in terms of how it relates to pain. Um, there's differences, biological differences, they're related to sex hormones in males versus females and how pain is processed and therefore pain experience influences pain experience in the biological level. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, something that's kind of really interesting, I think in the, in the research realm, which has kind of been brought to light more recently is kind of how um, male predominated that all the sex studies have been, even though clinically we see that female patients um, do experience or are at a higher prevalence to experience chronic lower, um, chronic pain in, in general. So really a fascinating area of research. The um, next question um, uh, from one of the participants here today um, was asking about um, whether or not any of the speakers have heard about injection of hydrogel to relieve lower back pain. I know that's not something that was uh, specifically talked about, but I know it was kind of brought up in the light of kind of the future of lower back pain. Yeah, I think um, there, there are some therapies out there, specifically gel therapies that um, can be injected into discs. And it sounds like that is mainly for back pain where we think the cause is from the degeneration of the disc over time. Um, we've, we've kind of mentioned before, and I think one of our anatomy lectures that the discs um, are you know, filled with water, with fluid, so they can dry out um, over time. Uh, so the thought I think is perhaps injecting it with the gel formulation to help restore the disc, the integrity of the disc. And um, I think it's still, it sounds like it may still be a fairly newer therapy that, um, that maybe does not quite have a lot of extensive data um, quite yet. But um, just from looking into this briefly, it, it does look like there are active um, clinical trials going on. Um, hopefully we'll get a little bit more data in the next year or so. Um, so it seems like still might be a little bit of an early therapy in terms of the data, but um, th that's that's a thought of how it, it might be helpful for certain types of, of low back pain. Yeah, that, that definitely sounds very exciting. And I'm, I'd be very interested to kind of hear the, the new data as it comes out, like you're suggesting, Dr. Chang. It's definitely always kind of a fine balance when we start 
kind of getting to kind of the frontiers of um, treatment options of balancing, you know, what's exciting and new um, versus actually having the evidence um, that is going to work or more importantly, be, be safe to, to, to kind of do onto patients or provide to patients. Can the wires, Dr. Chang, I think this uh, um, perhaps relates to you um, for, for the spinal cord stimulation section. Can the wires on the spinal cord stimulators be safely removed from patients if they don't respond to treatment? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, usually when we do the, the spinal cord stimulator implant, we start off with the trial. It's generally about a week long. Um, so the epidural leads are placed for the duration of the trial, and they get removed at the end of that one-week trial. And that's usually a fairly straightforward um, procedure where we just pull, gently pull out the epidural leads, and um, usually they come out without any issue. Um, I think if, if um, the patient does well with the trial and proceeds to the implant, the epidural leads are often placed back in. Now, if those leads have been in for a long period of time, you know, months or years, um, they sort of get um, kind of stuck in that area. So it's not that they can never be removed, but um, depending on, you know, how long they've been in there, it, it might be a little bit risky to then try to pull them out um, if you're not having a response to the spinal cord stimulated treatment anymore. So sometimes um, patients and their physicians may elect to keep the implant in place, um, even if they do not feel like they're getting uh, the pain relief from it any longer. It's just that the system may be turned off, but um, everything might still remain in place. And that's not necessarily dangerous, but it's, it's now it's an implant um, that you, you've got inside. Um, you know, kind of like when we get certain dental work done, it, it's, it sort of remains with you. Um, but, but yeah, sometimes if the leads can be safely removed, it just really depends on the, that individual patient and how, how long the, the leads have been in place for. Yeah, I, I think maybe a, a follow-up question to that, which I, I think we, we get quite, a, um, quite commonly is patients asking, you know, now that I have this implant, um, is there anything they need to do differently when they, when they travel or they, when they fly, for example? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's a metal device. So for example, when you're going through the, the metal detector for, for uh, with TSA, um, you know, you do need to let the um, TSA agents know that you have a device in place because it probably is going to show up on the um, x-ray scan that they do. Um, it shouldn't necessarily change the function of your device as you're going through the scanner. Um, but you just need to let them know you, you have this device in place. And, um, you know, before traveling, it's also good to touch base with your device company and you can specifically ask them if there's any restrictions. Oftentimes they can issue you a letter um, so that you can carry that with you. Um, and then similarly, if you're undergoing certain procedures or surgeries, you, you should let your surgeon or physician know that you have this implant inside of you, sometimes it can affect whether you can get other procedures done safely, like ablations of the heart, for example. Um, again, not that it can't be done safely, but there may be adjustments that have to be made um, from that end. So yes, once you've got the device in place, um, you should you know, at the very least carry, um, have some information about it from the device company and share that information with, with your other physicians. So, sounds pretty in line with kind of pacemakers and, and lots of insulin pumps and, and lots of kind of standard medical devices that are implanted. Um, Dr. Keller, lots of um, interesting discussions and questions from your talk. Um, one attendee, um, wanted to find out uh, from, if, if, if one was to enroll as a study participant in the studies that you described, do the participants get see the results of the MRIs that are taken, the EMGs and the other studies that are performed? Um, what's the incentive for them to participate in the study? Do they get a treatment recommendation at the end or do they, 
are they just participating out of the goodness of their heart? Um, because it sure sounds like it could be very time consuming. Totally agree with that statement. It is, um, I would say it is time consuming. Um, uh, so the treatment itself is about an hour, depending on when you where you live, uh, commute time would definitely contribute to that. So the study takes about, so you have 12 visits, um, and then there's two, two visits for assessments before and two visits uh, for assessments after. So there's about 14 visits to the lab that um, would, you know, um, are included in participating in the clinical trial. So yes, it could be time consuming. Um, the incentive uh, is, uh, we definitely are able to make um, and share the brain MRIs um, with, with the participants upon request. So for example, you will have your brain picture for free, done for you for free. Um, and so that, that those things can be shared. Um, the uh, um, results are, I mean, hopefully, uh, obviously we cannot guarantee it. That is why we are doing the trial, but it is possible. And uh, one of the participants re reporting long-term pain relief right now. So um, it is possible that you will have reduction in pain, right? That is why we're conducting that. So to me, that is probably the main um, incentive. However, it is not guaranteed. So um, that is the nature of pilot clinical trials um, where we do not have a, a lot of funding. In the future studies, when we do have federal funding, uh, supporting the, the study, it, we hope to provide, you know, financial um, reimbursements for your parking, things like that, and also for just your time and participating in the trial. But there's also a little bit of a different study design. We we'll always have to disclose the fact that patients were paid for the participation because there could be screening the results. So there's different things that um, we have to consider when we design these studies. But so I would say the goodness of the heart, it was most certainly... <laughs> something that we really rely on in the study as of right now, but we can make th certain things like um, the MRI and the EMG is a little bit different, but it could be also any of the data that we're collecting. Obviously you have rights to it and we're able to share that with you if you would like that. And, and to kind of dovetail off that um, question as well is how does a patient qualify for the simulator study that you described and how do you ensure diversity, equity in the participant selections? And then lastly, um, is this covered by insurance or, or do patients or study participants, um, could they get billed uh, for the extra care? Very good question. Um, you are not billed for any of the procedures that are in the study. The only expenses are going to be, you know, your travel. So if you live you know, further away from Mission Bay where we are doing the study. So, you know, any sort of gas or parking that you would have to pay, those are your only expenses. Um, now, living in San Francisco, I know that could accumulate fast, but um, we are not, you know, you're not going to be charged for your MRI, for any of the procedures, for therapy, all of that is complementary as for you to participate in the study. So there's no charges and your insurance will not be billed for any of that. Um, the way that patients qualify, so the inclusion exclusion criteria showed we basically screen participants, making sure that you match into that in, into the um, those outline criteria. Um, and the way that we ensure diversity, I mean, um, basically, as of right now, the way that this works, anybody who's contacting me, I, I'm screening them, and there's obviously no there's no uh, cutoffs based on your race. In fact, uh, I really would encourage any other any race other than white to apply because it's actually um, something that NIH in all of our grants there is a specific document that we we'll always have to fill out to make sure that we are considering recruitment of uh, diverse groups of patients. So that is something we actively pursue and encourage and seek that um, variety of participants from socioeconomic backgrounds and. Uh, racial backgrounds are uh, able to participate in the study. We um, so ensuring is is um, that you know the fact that the trial is open and we I I you know uh, have physicians and uh, different groups of um, clinicians who are working with me and so you know they're as as long as a participant is eligible based on certain criteria we have to define um, for, you know mostly in terms of the pain intensity or the BMI, and I saw another question about BMI, so I would answer that um, next as well. But yeah, so there's just certain things that based on 
uh, how other studies are conducted in order for us to compare the results, we have to define inclusion exclusion criteria, but race or any sort of economic backgrounds are not part of inclusion exclusion criteria, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it and it's so, you know, that question is so poignant because it's so important that the recruitment really reflects the patient population that you're, you know, trying trying to to treat because you know, I think historically um, a lot of clinical trials have ended up recruiting a lot of kind of Caucasian uh, study participants and and it, and it really kind of um, puts everyone else at this as a disadvantage because you know you can't it's really challenging to extrapolate the information there the data that's generated and kind of apply that to kind of different um, patient groups because they they might inherently be very different. Um, so thank yeah. you for kind of touching on that. Um, in your in your clinical trial, how do you account for the effects of extraneous things outside the device that you're testing? Like, you know, person loses weight or their stress increases or decreases um, or they start and stop exercising, things that we know could impact people's experience of pain. So um, one of the inclusion and exclusion criteria, or I would say inclusion criteria, is that we require the participants, whatever medication or sort of regimen uh, that they already have in place to manage their pain, because obviously we don't expect this is a regrouping of chronic patients specifically. So uh, we understand that patients already have some sort of ways that they've been managing pain and dealing with pain. So we ask that before you participate in the trial for two weeks prior to initiation of our experiment, um, that you do not change your medication, right? So if you are taking NSAIDs, a stable dose or whatever drugs that you've been prescribed right, prescribed from, from a, um, pharmacologically to treat pain, we ask that you do not change that. If it has to change, we know that, right? And so in our analysis, we are able to then include that as a confounding factor or some sort of a factor to, uh, um, to account for in the analysis. So um, oftentimes, you know, when we think about variability, like, right, like what research is, is our, uh, we're trying to account and dissect ver variability, right? And what makes the low back pain so challenging because there's just so many factors and variables that we have to account for. So, but there are analytical methods for us to, instead of minimizing variability and trying to really strictly, strictly control for everything, instead we just collect it as data and there's machine learning algorithms that are able to parse out there are supervised and unsupervised machine learning approaches that are able to dissect what is really affecting pain. Is it the, this, you know, say transcutaneous spinal stimulation, or is it because they exercised or didn't exercise that day? So there's ways that as long as we're able to track, and this is what I ask my patients, if there's any changes, you know, first we ask that there's no changes, but obviously life is life. And within a month of our study, it's possible that, you know, you've changed something or you had to change it. And we just make a note of that and we record that as another variable. And it could be uh, then included into the analysis and dealt with it after the data has been collected, if that makes sense. There is definitely mathematical, again, we always rely on math at the end of the day to, to make sense of the findings. Excellent, thank you. Um, and um, this question, I think, can be both to Dr. Keller and Dr. Chang um, for the transcutaneous spinal cord stimulation that you presented, Dr. Keller, or um, just spinal cord stimulation that you presented, Dr. Chang. Um, in, in what setting is that available? Is that something that primary care providers would, would know about, or is that something that's exclusively in the realm of specialists and, and, um, and you know, in terms of kind of where these enrolling in clinical studies or using these more advanced, perhaps more invasive um, therapies, where does that fit into treatment algorithms? Are these kind of things of last resort? Could they be used a little earlier if patients are interested in? If you had any thoughts on, on um, that? Yeah, I think in, in terms of the, the um, implantable spinal cord stimulators, I think generally um, patients are probably either hearing about it, you know, from friends or family who might already have it, and then um, kind of approaching any of their physicians about it, whether it's their primary doctor or sometimes their, their pain management specialist. Um, 
So sometimes it, we, it, it kind of starts with that route, a patient hearing about it. Um, other times we get referrals um, from surgeons, um, particularly from spine surgeons, uh, neurosurgeons, who uh, maybe have worked with the patient before and, and even done surgery. And so that's kind of maybe an example of um, patient having persistent pain after surgery or, or despite surgery. And um, sometimes we get patients referred to us um, from that route, from the surgeon. Um, and then other times I think it's sort of a um, modality that kind of comes up organically as we work with patients in the pain clinic. And it really depends on um, a combination of things, including the patient's preference. You know, sometimes patients prefer things that are less invasive and want to work on medication management or physical therapy, or even perhaps try some injections. Um, and sometimes their preference is to do those things first and before approaching the topic of spinal cord stimulation. Um, other times it comes up a little bit earlier. Uh, again, just kind of depending on on um, each individualized patient and what their what their preferences are and their health history is, um, but I think that it kind of depends on that back and forth relationship with the pain physician. Um, and usually, the um, physicians who who implant these, they're um, you know pain management fellowship trained, so they may have a background in anesthesia or um, neurology or physical medicine and rehabilitation, um, who then do pain management fellowship and are trained to do these implants. Um, it's also notable that some um, other specialties may implant it as well. So neurosurgeons may implant spinal cord stimulation. Um, they may have a different technique of doing it, but, but that's also another route um, through which a patient might um, ultimately um, decide on having this on having this device. Um, and as far as for transcutaneous, yeah, so our goal um, eventually, I think the way that it will have to be uh, tested and established is that it would start probably either either in the uh, physician office or a physical therapy office, most likely. Uh, where, you know, physical therapists will be trained how to place the electrodes on, how to identify specific levels for each of the participants, where the electrodes need to go. Uh, so it requires a little bit of learning, you know, curve for palpation, but it's also something that could be eventually even, you know, a little tattoo of where that, uh, you know, the electrodes need to be placed. I mean, that's already less invasive than, um, you know, having the surgical implantation of the device, but that's something that could be done. Um, and, you know, a, a partner or uh, somebody, another uh, participant, uh, individual in a household would be able to place the electrodes um, where they need to go. And then, you know, um, we will be working on making the devices wireless eventually and, and all of that in order to, but, you know, that's really a long way out. But uh, we, we are hoping to, to make that, um, way more accessible uh, to patients. So it's either going to be, I think it will start with um, offices in physical in physical therapy where the your your parameters will be identified for you and you can use them. Um, and then uh, you, you know you can take it home with you or eventually it could be something that the participant can be trained and as long as there is particular manual which, who likes manuals, right? I think it would be better always to have a physician or physical therapist explain how to use it first and train participants or patients to do that at home. There was one question that I saw about the BMI and um, I want to make sure that I address that, uh, why, why um, individuals with higher BMI are excluded. So as of right now, the reason why we have to limit the inclusion of BMI is because the electrodes go on the skin. And so if you have a lot of subcutaneous fat, um, a lot of tissue, it is likely that there may be a, well, we don't know that has to be tested. So all of the trials and clinical trials I conducted in phases. So first we have to make sure that the limiting factor is not, you know, like that, how much tissue there is between the electrode and the, um, and the current, because there is number of individuals who 
would benefit that. If we were to include individuals who have a lot of subcutaneous fat, and that is going to be the limiting factor for passing the current, that will really dilute the results and will make the results less clear. Um, and if that's the case, then it will prevent therapy going forward to the participants who have lower BMI, who have pain. Um, now, we do realize that pain, low back pain is associated with higher BMI. So we will be testing that eventually and hoping to find that. But it's just, it just has to come in stages. So eventually the study will be open and have higher inclusion uh, of BMI. So yeah, but it's a good question. And I'm sorry that we're not able to offer that at the moment. I just want to use this opportunity to kind of thank everyone for joining us over the, the past six weeks as you know, me, Dr. Chang, Dr. Keller, and all the other presenters um, kind of shared with you the things that we're really passionate about. Um, and this by no means is, um, you know, I expect people to be able to diagnose and, and treat and prescribe their own back pain for family and friends, but really just a way to kind of share with you guys the kind of a lot of the nuances and, and lots of, um, kind of challenges that the field presents and but also some of the successes that um, this field really has um, been able to accomplish and especially today you know some of the really exciting stuff that Dr. Keller and Dr. Chang have presented that really kind of um, make the future very bright I know we have a long ways to go but it's it's definitely very promising mm -hmm.